program. We have naturalist Kurt Valenta with us. We have enjoyed his previous programs on the beaver and owls. He began his lifetime career working in the technology field, but then changed career choices and now runs an educational nature studies program based out of Enosburg Falls in Vermont. Today he will present the black bear, nature's voracious omnivore. We'll take a close sub look at the smallest of the three bear species found in North America, who lives in a wide variety of habitats, including our backyards. They are anything but cuddly teddy bears. This program is co-sponsored by the Escutney Mountain Audubon Society. Please welcome Kurt Valenta. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm honored. This is my third appearance here, and uh, always nice to see so many faces, and I hope I can face up to the pressure of big audiences and what they want to see. But it's easy to uh, have a good talk when you have a great subject. And uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, black bear. Nature's voracious omnivore. An omnivore because he'll eat anything and everything. So um, 25 million years ago, the bear actually broke away from the canid uh, family. And uh, we actually have, and the, uh, the bear dog became extinct. And the bear family continued on, as did the dog family. And so the uh, bear, this is what the cladogram for the bear looks like. Um, you can see that uh, the brown bear, which gave rise to the grizzly and the Kodiak, and then the Maritima uh, ursus bear, which is the polar bear. The black bear uh, came in um, further down the line and is uh, related to the Asian black bear. All the bears that we have in North America actually came across the land bridge. So there are three species, as I said before, the polar bear, which was the bear that stayed around the water and therefore became a maritime bear. The brown bear, the Arctos uh, bear, uh, gave rise to the grizzly in the west and also the Kodiak bear, which is the largest bear. And then the black bear. The black bear is throughout North America and actually has 12 subspecies. And uh, depending on where in the country you are, you might have a, uh, a variety of colors as well. For example, the cinnamon bear is exactly that, a cinnamon color. And then uh, there's also the, uh, the Vancouver uh, Island black bear that can come in white. And the glacier bear and the Olympic bear can also be in white, as can be the Kermodan. So just to touch on it, although we're going to be talking about uh, black bears, um, I just wanted to touch on the other two species. Um, the polar bear is the largest land uh, carnivore. And here are some of, the, uh, some of his statistics. 25 miles an hour. Uh, the male can be up to 1,320 pounds. That's a Volkswagen lo um, loaded with a couple of college kids. <laughs> The female is much smaller, uh, but still, if you look at a standing female, six foot six, I'm six two, so bigger than I am, and the male up to eight feet, eight and a half feet. And when they stand um, with both, with all four legs on the ground, the shoulder height is four foot. So that's a good, good size up, a big dog. Their range is the Arctic Circle, circumpolar. So in other words, not just, not just in the Canadian uh, polar regions, but also uh, the Russian and the European, Greenland. Of course, they look really cute when they're small. <laughs> and then we have the grizzly bear. The guy in the left corner there, he's... Uh, <clears throat> He's resting up for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And if you notice, uh, the uh, subtitle to that is uh, Ursus Horribilis, um, because he can be quite intimidating. So, smaller than the polar bear, uh, three to three and a half feet in, in uh, shoulder height, uh, length seven foot when they stand up tall, and weight is considerably less as well. Much faster though. And lifespan, 20 to 25 years, that's on a good day. Most bears don't live that long because of hunting. Um, some of these photos are staged that way, not that the bear is any smaller, but depending on the way you take that picture, you can definitely um, you know, magnify what it looks like. But those bears still are very big. So this is the Ursus Arctos Middendorf, and this bear is basically confined to the Kodiak Islands in Alaska. Uh, good back scratcher on that claw. <laughs> So 6 to 1,300, up to 15 is the largest bear, uh, 10 feet tall, so just a little smaller than, the, uh, than the, arc, uh, the polar bear. The largest one in the wild was 1656 pounds with an 18 inch foot. So that's a triple E, maybe a quadruple E foot uh, shoe size. And you can see uh, compared to nature, uh, the one in captivity uh, became much, much bigger. It must have been all those McDonald's fries. <laughs> and here's a Kodiak bear that was actually uh, brought in from the wild as a cub and raised by this, uh, by this couple. Yeah. So you can, you can get a, a sort of a feel for the size difference. So the American black bear, we're gonna to touch on several uh, topics on the black bear. And hopefully by the time we finish, you'll have a good understanding of those black dogs that keep running through your gardens and your fields. Um, we do have a lot of black bears these days because um, we've had, it, like anything in nature, um, if the feed is good, if the mast is good, if the oak and the berries and the acorns and everything, the wild cherry is sufficient and has uh, given a lot of mast, then the animals that eat that will also lag behind but grow. And we've had a couple of good years of mast, um, so that's why there are so many bears uh, these days. So as I said before, uh, there are 12 different subspecies of the black bear, and the eastern uh, black bear is the one that we are going to uh, concentrate on. But here you can see some of the colors that I was talking about, the cinnamon bear and the uh, Kermodan white bear, but they're still considered black bears. So the eastern black bear, Ursus americanus, that's a male on the uh, top left and a female on the bottom right. We didn't really know about bears um, until we had a way of being able to tranquilize them because A, they were very secretive and B, they're also very big uh, and dangerous and if cornered, uh, can put up a horrible fight. So in the, uh, in the 60s, when we first started using tranquilizers drugs is the, when we first started uh, getting into, um, into understanding what the bear does, where he lives, and what their um, habits are. And not only did we tranquilize them and be able to tell more about their size and things, we also were able to put radio collars on them. And so didn't have to be following them, we could follow them with the radio signal, see where they hibernated, see where they ate, see what their ranges were. So this is in Vermont, and this is some of the things that we do with the uh, radio telemetry. Um, now where we have um, population uh, pressure because of wind towers or wind farms or uh, habitat um, 
being shrunk because of our moving into it, uh, we can do uh, counts and we can do um, um, surveys of areas to make sure that we're not maybe getting rid of some important territory that the bear really needs. Um, and you can see too, uh, we used to uh, ask him how, how old he was and he'd count on his claws the amount of birthday candles, but we've got a much better way of doing it these days. We take, and if you come up to the skull, you'll see it's missing. They take one tooth and they grind it and do it just like tree rings that each year of growth leaves a ring. And that's called cementum annuli. And, and they actually use that with most animals now. So here's some of the impacts that I was talking about, the wind projects, gas pipelines, and developments, especially in areas that I came down from Enosburg, drove through uh, Stowe, and Stowe um, put up a lot of condos and things on the mountain, and those mountains used to belong to the bears. So we need to understand what they're doing. Because if we don't, we're definitely going to have conflicts because the bear thinks that's his territory. And I actually, in Stowe, several years ago, gave a talk at the Stowe uh, Library, and at 1245 went back across the notch, and there was a mother bear with two cubs walking right in front of the uh, gondola, uh, the little gondolas that were going up the mountain. And I thought, gee, <laughs> does anybody know they're there? So here are some vital statistics on the bear. As you can see from this profile picture, it's the smallest bear. Um, and in the top corner, you can see the difference in the paw sizes as well. But when I say smallest, two, 300 pounds is still a big bear. So the full grown male between 250 and 350 pounds um, when you run into them in the woods, they always look like a thousand pounds. But. And the females are much smaller. They have a 30 year lifespan. But again, because of hunting pressures, um, that is rarely attained. The biggest black bear uh, was shot um, in. Uh, uh, Newfoundland, Maine, I believe. And that was, uh, they estimated 1,100 pounds because they could only get it out at 900 pounds live weight. Um, so to be able to tell whether you have a large bear or a small bear, I'm going to show you how to do that. So this is a large bear, all bears, have ears that are five inches long. But as they grow and get older, the ears seem to get smaller because the head and the fur is longer, right? So there's the large bear. And so you take it from the five inch uh, ear and then you draw a, a triangle to the nose and back. If that triangle is in, is a, uh, a equilateral triangle, you have a big bear. Whereas I'll show you what a small bear looks like. So this is a small bear. And if you do the same thing, you get an isosceles triangle. And you can see on this smaller bear, the ears seem to be a lot more prominent. Right? When you look at them compared. So the larger bear is down in the right-hand uh, corner. Which again, when you meet him in the woods, who cares how big he is, right? <laughs> <laughs> so two and a half to three feet shoulder height when they're running. And that's why sometimes uh, Great Danes or sheepdogs or whatever can be um, you know, mistaken for a bear. And when they stand up, four to six feet. So about my height when they stand up. Okay. 
And a naturalist once said, uh, a bear running looks like an animated 200 pound bowling ball. <laughs> and that's because they are amblers, and when they run, they put their feet, their front feet all the way back and reach forward with their back feet, and so they look like a ball. Um, top running speed is approximately 33 miles an hour. So human beings, fastest man on earth, can run 25 miles an hour. That's why the bear has a smile on his face. <laughs> That's the, old, that's the old joke about uh, if you're in the woods, um, I don't have to run as fast as a bear. I just have to run faster than you, right? <laughs> so the bear, um, the black bear, is the only arboreal bear. Neither the grizzly nor the polar bear do any tree climbing. And um, as you can see from these pictures, they can get into very, very tiny branches and uh, obviously trees, if you go into some wild areas, especially beech trees, you should be able to see beech, uh, see claw marks where the bear uh, has gripped onto the, the beech bark and pulled himself up. So let's just go back to here. So in this picture in the, where the bear is standing on the tree, what they do is just like a lineman in a, on a telephone pole. They'll put the back claws in, then reach up, pull up, put the back claws in again. And so they sort of winch themselves up on the tree. When they come down, uh, because the claws are curved, and if you come up, you can see these, this is a small bear, so it's not quite as curved. But the big bears have really big curves on their claws. They can't come down as easily. So what they do is they come down, and then to, to, at a certain height, they jump. And you can see it here. Um, so they come down like a cat, but the other problem is that this maneuver is dangerous. And so many young cubs actually die at this point. Look, you know, look before you leap, right? So here's a bear. If you're out in the woods, um, they have a bulky rounded look uh, because of the fat layer that's under their skin. Uh, the grizzly bear has a hump behind the shoulder, whereas the black bear does not. And they have short, sturdy legs, so that's where they get that, that bowling ball look. And if you come up after the talk and take a, a touch at this fur, you can see how dense it is. It's, he's got a guard hair outer fur and then a very dense inner fur that keeps him warm and dry. Very Romanesque. Um, the nose is long and slender, and they always have a tan muscle. Did I say that right? Muzzle, not muscle. <laughs> and there are the claws of a full grown bear. You can see how curved they are, and it's almost like having an ice pick that they clamp into the wood. Plantigrade. Bears are plantigrade. In other words, they're imperfect walkers, also known as waddlers. So what they do is they move the front and the back paw on one side, leaning on this side, and then when they're to the front, then they move the other side together forward. So they're back and forth. And then you can see that from their footprints that they've got that sort of waddling uh, walk, just like a skunk, a raccoon, um, a beaver. Uh, but the other thing, too, is that uh, their foot um, is very similar to a human being's, the bone structure. And um, can you tell which is the, the human and which was the bear from these two pictures? So the bear is actually this guy here. And that, that's the claw. Those, these are where the claw stumps go on. And this is the human hand. And down here, B is the uh, bear, and A is the human, uh, human hand. And um, police uh, departments or forensics classes actually have to give classes on how to tell the difference between a bear and a human, because there have been numerous cases where 
um, there have been mistaken identity and thinking that it was a human when it was a bear skeleton that was found. A bear is an omnivore. which means that if you were to take, uh, take your tongue and run it over the back part of your molars, your molars would be very similar to what the bear has. They're flat with uh, sharp edges, so they can grind up grains and things just like we do, and yet they have uh, very large can canines where, because they also um, chase running prey. Their eyes are to the front because they're born to hunt as opposed to eyes to the side where they're born to hide. That's a little ditty that we uh, teach the kids so they can tell whether it's a predator or a prey. So here you can see those molars that I was talking about and the canines uh, that are very pronounced. And the uh, tooth that uh, we take out um, is the one that's, uh, that would be missing would be right in here. So that you can see it on the other side. That's the one that we would cut to see what the rings are. So a bear is very good at seeing color and he can differentiate shapes. If you think what a bear does and what he eats, he needs to be able to tell the difference between a berry and a burr. And he needs to be able to tell whether it's a good red berry or a lousy white berry. Or a ripe blueberry. And then the other thing too is, like many animals, he's got a uh, tapetum lucidum, which is a um, behind the eye, uh, it magnifies the light. So it's a membrane where the light comes in, bounces back and bounces. So it, it travels back and forth twice, intensifying the amount of light that actually gets back to the, uh, to the nerve endings. And so they have very good night vision, but when light is shone into their eyes, it lights up like a dog's or other animals that we know. And the hearing is twice as good as our hearing. Well, probably three times as good as mine anyway. And uh, not only is it much better, but they can hear over a wider frequency. They can hear much lower and much higher frequencies than we can. And they always have such cute poses, don't they? But the, the sense that they have the best is the smell. And I titled this as, Dang Nose Always Gets Me Into Trouble. They can smell food from a mile away. So when, when they tell you about your bird feeders, uh, it's true. They, they know if they're downwind, they know there's food upwind. And I'm just waiting. I hope I knock on wood. I'm a beekeeper, and I've seen a bear close to our house, and I'm just hoping that there's more food at our neighbors than at my house. So. <laughs> But uh, they also love to swim. And this is in, <laughs> in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, can you imagine the family that woke up? They had just told their kids, go, go have a swim. Go play outside. <laughs> but uh, there has been a bear that uh, was seen uh, in, uh, in the Mexican, in the Pacific, uh, s uh, swimming quite a few miles offshore. So they are very good swimmers. Love to swim. So the Gulf of Mexico, just uh, the previous uh, nine miles offshore. That's a heck of a distance. Uh, the litter size is from one to three cubs, um, with four to five being unusual or rare. And that's simply because they have to range for their food. Uh, so if, uh, if it's been good uh, mast uh, harvests, then they probably have three. If it's been super, then more, but usually one or two. Two is the normal. Um, when they are born, they weigh approximately half a pound, and they're the size of a chipmunk. Um, they reach maturity uh, at an average age of uh, three and a half years. 
So and that's when they start to begin to mate as well. Uh, but that can range anywhere from two to six. Um, and the cub mortality, part of what I said before, when they jump off a tree, um, there's lots of dangers for uh, cubs and also um, uh, food supplies. Um, so cub mortality can be uh, around 20%, is usually around 20% on the average, but can be as high as 50%. Mating takes place between uh, May and July, and females give birth every other year because they'll take care of the, uh, the, the cubs through the year, and at a year and a half, time to hit the road, Jack. Um, and the, the husband, or the, the husband, the male um, is, uh, is just around for the mating and then he's gone. So, and he's a, uh, he's a solitary uh, animal. And the only family life that these cubs will know is that first year and a half. Once the mother kicks them out, then they are solitary as well. Gestation period is between 63 to 70 days. So birth usually occurs in January and early February during hibernation. Um, and the bears have something that is unique. It's called the delayed implementation or implantation. So they can actually be impregnated, but she doesn't uh, drop the egg uh, onto the uterus until she knows uh, things are good and it's also uh, combined with her body weight. So if she doesn't have enough body weight, her pregnancy will never become a reality. But if she finds enough food in the fall to be able to see that pregnancy through in the winter, that's when she becomes pregnant. And it's, uh, the body weight is 150 pounds. So in the past, bear dogs. These are the, these are the uh, that was the branch that I had put up earlier on were the ones that uh, became extinct. But we still have the same sort of um, exhibition of habits, both in the dog, here in the wolf, and in the polar bear, the muzzle grab. Uh, oh yeah, him too. So this is still the guy with the, with the Kodiak. I'm not sure if, I think he's checking for his teeth, <laughs> if, they, if they've been brushed properly, but. <laughs> So the Etruscan bear that came over the land bridge is the forebear of the black bear. Uh, it, it involved, uh, or it evolved 500,000 uh, before the present. And the bear was very sacred to the first peoples um, because of its strength, because of its beauty. Um, and so they valued it very highly. A lot of their um, rituals were centered around the bear. And uh, the bear was also seen as a, a health healing powers, primarily because um, First Peoples lived off the land and ate um, the, the fruits and the berries and the herbs that the land provided, and so did the bear. So that's where that healing medicine connection came in. But when the settlers came, they saw the bear as a threat. And obviously when they put a homestead out and they weren't quite used to uh, the wilds of America and all the stories they had from Europe, um, they, they went after the bear. And you can see um, the settlers made great use of the bear um, from coats that are very heavy, very dense, very warm. Um, they also uh, bear rug and uh, kept their houses warm with it. And the one thing that uh, very little is known uh, is that they use the bear fat for all kinds of things, for cooking, for uh, salad dressings, 
And uh, so, and there's a, a big market even today still. And then the other thing that happened was that the bear's habitat was encroached upon. Large scale logging, uh, settlements, uh, bounties. And uh, <clears throat> there was an act in 1695 that I've got highlighted here that said that every brave uh, from the Indian nations had to bring in um, a certain amount of uh, carnivores. And so they had to uh, bring in either a bear, um, I've got it not noted here, they had to uh, bring in uh, a bear, or they had to bring in two bobcat, or they had to bring in a cougar. And if they didn't, they were whipped. And so obviously that was a great hunting pressure on the animals. Um, 1688, prior to that, um, Father Jacques Gravier, who was a Jesuit missionary, was walking in the woods along the riverbank, and he noted in his journals that he saw, and this was along the Ohio River, that in a single day he saw 50 bears. So they were prolific prior to then. And uh, also because bears can, there's, there's several videos if you're interested in YouTubes that show bears walking on their back legs just like humans do. So that connection with the uh, First Nations and the human characteristics the bear had were also part of that. So bears biography. All right, here's the test. Oh, I didn't warn you, did I? Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> Bears can't down, run downhill, true or false? false? Mothers give birth in their sleep, wake up in spring and are surprised to have cubs. <laughs> true or false? false? Menstrual odors trigger bear attacks. False. Bears, black bears stink. Mother black bears are more likely to attack. Mothers reject cubs if, with human scent. Bears don't feel pain like humans. You pinched a bear, didn't you? <laughs> bears attack if they sense fear. When bears lose fear of humans, they are more likely to attack. They're all false. And the thing that's really funny, the number three, the menstrual odors, is still in state publications warning about bears. Um, black bears are less likely to attack, even mother bears, because I had said that they were arboreal, and so there, when they are under threat, any animal, any wild animal, doesn't want to use up energy fighting if they can escape. And so a black bear, if under threat, if they have trees close by, to the trees, they won't fight you. If you are between their cub and them, that's a different threat. Or if you're between their escape route and their cubs, that's a different threat. But most bears will not attack. Um, and bears feeling pain, they have the same um, nerve networks that we do. So they feel just as much pain as we do. And bears can't run downhill? No. <laughs> do not test that theory. They can run any which way they want to at 33 miles an hour. And the, I like this one. What? I've got babies? Um, they are, even though they hibernate, um, they are aware of, they, they have a mother's sense. Um, they are aware of their babies. So life begins, as I said, in uh, January, February, in um, some in a den that could look very much like this. And there he is, half pound, size of a chipmunk, blind, hairless, helpless, and mewling and. But within a very short period of time, as the baby is fed, or as the cub is fed, 
uh, bear milk has 30% fat content. The only fat content that is higher in the nature is a gray seal in, uh, in the uh, Arctic water, in Antarctic waters. So that's at 53%. Whereas you compare that to uh, human and cow milk, which is at 4.9%. And if you drink skim milk, it's even less. So the bear gets, uh, gets a good jump start in life and goes from uh, naked to fully haired by the time he's ready to come out of the den three months later. They're kind of ugly though, sorry. Not politically correct, I guess. And the other thing is that the baby cub cries just like a child. And that if you heard them side by side, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Well, the mother bear can, but uh, they still cry like that. And the bear, the bear calls its mother just with the same kind of cry. They do a lot of mock fighting. You see the muscle grab there, or the muzzle grab there, um, the cuffing. But what they do is to keep themselves from being injured, they use their ears as signals. And so if you go into bear country, it behooves you to understand bear, uh, bear signals with the ears. And I'll, I'll show you that. You can take notes so you'll know. But motherly love. Um, so once, the, uh, once the, the mating has taken place and the, as I said, the, the male takes off, he wanders around lonely again. But the mother uh, then takes the cubs and um, teaches them everything they need to know from what kind of foods to gather, where to gather, where to best have dens and things. And she does that in a year and a half. For the bears at that time of life, it's the hardest because they're, they're being schooled. They don't know. And if they start crossing into human uh, territories, uh, I had a friend that hit a bear on Thursday, this past Thursday, and uh, up in uh, Jay, coming home from working at late shift in Jay. So, and it was a big bear. It was a 300-pound bear. So there's 50% of the animals uh, die at this point. And then the, the cubs, once they're chased off, the male cubs travel much further than the female cubs. The female cubs tend to stay closer to mom in neighboring territories, whereas the male cubs head out cross country. And so they're more apt to be subjected to dangers. Because of telemetry, radio telemetry, we've been able to track and understand where the shy animal uh, makes its home. And it's usually in transitional forests. Uh, in other words, um, where there's a lot of bush, where there's a lot of first stage growth, uh, such as old farmsteads that have been um, homesteads that are, that are transitioning back to forest. <laughs> On the top left-hand corner, you see a tree where uh, the three cubs are. Those are usually nursery trees, usually big white pine, where the mother might park, their, uh, park the cubs for the day while she forages. Or if there's, uh, you might walk in the woods and never even know that there's some bears sitting up there watching you. They won't come down until she calls. And you can see the varied uh, you know, streams, but it's all very bushy. Um, and number two, trees suitable for climbing. A bear will, when coming out of the woods or crossing an open area, will go, from, will go out of their way to go close to trees and zigzag from trees, from tree to tree, just so it always has an escape route. Their diet is, as I said before, omnivore. Depending on the season, depending on what they eat uh, or what, what grows in their area, they can eat anywhere from uh, anything from uh, berries and grass and bees to uh, 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 nuts, skunk cabbage. 
uh, and even uh, they're more apt to be uh, scavengers than they are to be actual predators. Although they do, they can uh, be predators. And of course, <laughs> nasty habits too. So anybody who keeps bees, if they've ever been in bear country, they might have seen a beehive like that. Um, down below, cars with food, those were actually bears. Um, these were bears in, uh, in Virginia, I believe. And grizzly bears will take a car apart too. And for any of you that have thought your bird feeder is safe, check out the aerialist. <laughs> I mean, this was strung on a very small cable, right? And uh, sometimes, but not very often, they go after domestic livestock. But to do that, they really do have to be hungry. The biggest thing is the, um, is the garbage cans, especially in state parks. So down in, uh, in the Smoky Mountains, they have uh, garbage cans that are big garbage disposal places where you have to you have to be smart and understand the sequence of things you have to get into because otherwise the bears would be in it. Uh, the thing that's really interesting about the bear, as big and as clumsy as he looks, he's a very delicate eater. He will he or she will take their berries and sort of quietly clamp across the berry and then pull it off the twig, making sure not to get too many leaves. Uh, or when they, uh, with their strong claws, they'll actually take uh, ant um, rotten logs and rip them apart for ants and then carefully slurp up the ant without taking along dirt. You can see down in the uh, bottom right-hand corner, if you go into the woods, uh, especially now, check for um, beech trees that have nests because um, if they're probably about a foot in diameter or more and if they have a nice fork, um, the bear will sit in that fork and then pull in branches and make a nest and sit on them and as he pulls them in, he'll eat the, the uh, nuts off them, the beech nuts. And so, and when, when you're done, when he's done or she's done, the branches are all sort of cracked and broken, and, but there's a nice nest, and that's a sign of a bear. So he seldom eats, they seldom eat debris. And I can just, when I, when I was researching this and saw this picture, I mean, can you imagine? A patui. Hey, would you stop that? <laughs> and when you get good at tracking, bear signs are really neat to find. So a stick that you don't know how it got broken is probably a bear pulling it down for the fruit on top. Or if there's a, uh, um, a tree, uh, a, a rotten log that's been ripped apart, that's probably a bear looking for grubs and things. The beer can with a little bit of beer left was a teenager beer, bear trying to get a drink and fruit, and these, uh, that uh, tree on the bright bottom, that's the kind of claw mark that you see where they're pulling up onto the tree going up. So they have um, ranges quite large, the male range is much larger than the females, but they choose them on the basis of these four uh, criteria. Um, or three rather, food availability, how varied the food is, the amount of cover that they have, and denning sites, especially important for females. So denning sites can be a hollow log uh, or a hollow tree, can be uh, um, a cave a, um, between rocks or a brush pile. So if you've done some lumbering in your, in your woods and you've left a brush pile, don't be surprised if you end up with a bear under it. Um, so when a bear has a range, and I heard several uh, people speak today already that said, oh yeah, we've seen that bear four times for, uh, for over the last four years. They do keep the same range, and they will always return back to the same areas. 
And the other thing is just as we have, just as we have uh, summer cottages or winter houses, so do bears. And they actually have areas that they might be able to go to for that special apple tree or that special blueberry patch where they take a hike for the day or for, for a week or whatever. And again, if you walk in the woods, uh, bears are territorial, mark their territory, and they do it in a number of different ways. Sue Morse, has anybody heard of Susan Morse? Yeah. So Susan Morse has a place up in Richmond, um, I don't know how many acres, and she uh, studies uh, bobcat, bear, and um, I went up there once and she showed me a tree that had a bite mark in it. So a bear will actually will open its mouth, check for a tree that has that sort of diameter, and then bite it and leave, I assume, scent on it and also mark it so that they know whatever next bear comes along. Oh, this is a bear that, oh my gosh, he's got a big jaw because that's a big diameter tree. Or they take their back and they rub it, and the other thing they do is they'll take a smaller tree and sort of bend it over and then rub on it. So you can, uh, you can find uh, hair, you can find claw marks, you can find teeth marks if you know what you're looking for. So in the spring, um, the activity level varies uh, for a bear throughout the year. In the spring, he's kind of slow. He's just coming out of hibernation. There isn't a lot of food yet, so he eats a uh, couple of hours during the day, sleeps quite a bit. Uh, summertime, um, that's when the bear is on the move. They eat a lot more. They're marking their territory. But in the fall, they're in hyperactivity because that's where they're gaining weight. That's where they are getting ready for hibernation. And then obviously in winter, sleep time. They're not true hibernators like bats, groundhogs, chipmunks, snakes. They sleep with one eye open. <laughs> so a true hibernator uh, goes into hi hibernation very quickly and then comes out of it very slowly. Whereas a bear takes a long time to go into hibernation and comes out of it very quickly. And that's why, too, um, there are scientists that go into uh, bear dens to tag, to do a count on the cubs and to tag the bears. Not sure if I'd want that job. <laughs> so and the denning length depends on the amount of um, snow there is. So if there's snow on the ground, the bears will stay in their dens. If the snow leaves early, they'll come out earlier, too and then obviously the amount of food that is around. And dens can be of many types. So we see the cave on the top left-hand corner, and they usually put that in, they stuff it with leaves or grass or hay or anything to make it comfortable. And there are even dens if you've seen a big knot hole further up. One den was found 30 feet above the ground. So that was a high-rise bear. <laughs> and as I said, brush piles. So a den cross-section, again, it's like they have to maintain their heat, so they make it just big enough that they can lie in there and maintain their body heat and heat the space around them. So it's pretty tight. And I'm sure if you walk in the woods a lot, you've probably come across some of these and didn't even know that you were right beside a bear den. So here's uh, lined with uh, hay, the brush pile, the little rock cave. Make it comfort comfortable for themselves. And sometimes in the spring when they've come out of uh, hibernation, uh, they even have open air uh, dens where they'll pile in hay and then they're open uh, to the weather. And of course, as we encroach upon their uh, territories, they'll make, uh, they'll use whatever we give them. So in storm drains, 
uh, and also under crawl spaces and houses. So hibernation, also known as dormancy or winter sleep, topor, carnivorian lethargy. That's a great one. That's what I do, carnivorian <laughs> lethargy. Actually, omnivorian lethargy. But um, it's very important. Um, their body temperature goes down. Their metabolism goes down. Um, they put their snoot under their fur to keep themselves warm because this is open. And the mother curls up next to the babies, to the cubs, and keeps her body temperature uh, warming them. And they regulate their body temperature according to what the temperature is around the, uh, in the cave. So they don't eat, they don't drink. Uh, they actually create a fecal plug. Um, that in the springtime is expelled once they come out of their, their cave. And so they, the body reuses some of that stuff and doesn't, uh, doesn't really, they don't, they burn everything up that they've uh, um, stored. And so uh, it can last five to seven months. So if we've had a very hard winter, those bears will come out very skinny. Um, and look at the heart rate goes from 55 beats per minute to nine. So we don't really understand hibernation very well and what, what all the implications are, but there is quite a bit of uh, investigation uh, into it because it has implications for weight loss as well as for heart patients that uh, if we can understand how they can have such a low um, metabolism without affecting their brains, um, it's important for heart disease and so on and so forth. So it's an important field. And this little guy created a porch right below his meal. So he didn't have to go very far. And then in the springtime, when the water starts dripping off the eaves or the trees and the flowers start coming through, warmer temperatures, that's their signal to wake up and come on out. And of course, the bird feeders we have in our backyards. That's how skinny a bear can be. 15 to 20 percent weight loss. And uh, although the, the lean tissue basically stays the same. Bears and people. Oh, aren't they cute? <laughs> so as I said, bears, uh, black bears are arboreal, and they always look for an escape route, and there's the mom chasing those cubs up, and they'll go right to the tippy tops and sit on the branches. You wouldn't even notice it. Not the grizzly, though. The grizzly lives in open tundra or in places where there aren't trees. He's not, uh, he can't climb trees, and therefore he's the one that's going to fight. And he's big too, right? So read the signs. Ears are flattened. That's a warning. And uh, if it were me, I'd be showing him my backpack and going the other way. So here are the warning signs. Um, in the first stage, low moans, blowing sounds, woofing, and jaw popping. So if you hear him woof or do any of those things, that's, that's just his warning shot across the bow. They will also feign attacks. Now that will usually scare you. Um, and, but the ears aren't flattened. They're up. And he runs at you, she runs at you, and then stops just short. Or, stage three, hind legs up, <clears throat> swat the paw. Doesn't hit you, but, uh, and may also blow and huff. Stage four, 
uh, head is down, flat ears like you saw in the previous picture. And then the fifth stage, and this is getting pretty close to hairy, is that uh, they will bite and snap and they'll push you down and they'll force, uh, force you with their claws. But they don't necessarily want to kill you, they just want you out. Um, <laughs> good to know. Can you put it into practice? I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, but the thing is, it's good to know. The other thing is, if you do encounter a bear, don't run. Make as much noise as you can. Be as aggressive as you can. Sticks, stones, make lots of noise and this type of thing. They'll see you as a big, aggressive thing that they might not want to attack. Or stand behind someone that's big and aggressive. <laughs> So when the bear says, stay away, stop your annoying behavior. Don't go up to him with a camera and say, really? I really want to take your picture. And keep facing the bear, but retreat slowly and keep making noise. Never run. When you run, you're pr the prey. And when the bear escalates the aggression, <laughs> don't panic. Uh, right? Throw rocks. The other thing, too, is if you know you're going into bear country, take a water pistol or a can with rocks in it. Be prepared. And if you have a can with rocks in it, that sound is very aggressive to the bear. They don't know what it is, and it'll stop them. And be bear smart. Um, in Virginia, when we were in the uh, Smoky Mountains, they had all kinds of sa signs of what you should and shouldn't do because you're in bear country. And uh, my daughter actually saw one when she was going to the bathroom, uh, to the bathhouse. So they are out there and they are curious about you. So follow the signs. So what about the future? In the past, we've had a very um, mixed sort of relationship with bears. I remember when I was a kid, um, they were circus performers. I think they might, they, I don't think they have any now anymore, maybe in Europe, but uh, they used to have bears that rode on bicycles and did tricks and whatnot. That's not what a true wild animal is supposed to be doing. And then the other thing we do too is we glorified them in, or, or babyfied them in, in stories. You know, Yogi Bear and Boo Boo and uh, the Park Ranger. Um, and then we had uh, Pooh and all those, the three bears. So we never really got to understand the bear. And um, I brought a whole bunch of um, teddy bears along, my wife's godmother actually made the big one and some of the other ones. And the bear uh, became a symbol for kids around the time that FDR freed a bear from chains. There was a, a tiny cub that was uh, chained to an outside structure of some sort and he freed the bear and that made headlines and then all of a sudden bears were a big, uh, a big commodity for kids. And uh, the one that's beside, the, the tan bear that's beside the big black one is actually my childhood bear, which is a Steiff uh, from Europe. It used to moan when you turned it and it's kind of worn and, and stuff. But uh, they have become very big collection, not this one, because this one's really worn and stuff. But uh, if you have a Steiff bear that's an original one, it can be worth quite a bit of money. And of course, there we go from um, the cute cuddly bears to uh, monsters and uh, some people have it on there uh, that the only, good, the only good bear is a dead bear. <laughs> so we really need to find some sort of in-between and <laughs> If you, if you go into areas that have, like uh, the state parks down in the Smokies and stuff, you see some of this. And that is really crazy because it is a wild animal and who knows. And if you get the bear to, accustomed to being with you uh, or being with humans, 
that's not good for the bear because he doesn't, she doesn't understand the dangers that human beings can bring. And if something shocks it and the bear eats, you know, chews a baby or bites a human, guess what happens to the bear? Even though it wasn't there, it wasn't their fault. So a bear is persistent, adaptable, can live in a wide range of habitats, and can live close to people and still thrive. And the thing about a bear is, when we think of a bear, it's associated with a wilderness of which only few remnants exist. So the bear reminds us not only of the wilderness we have lost, but also of what remains. It's the spirit of the wilderness. And so, just in case, let me show you this little video. This is a guy in a car, and there's the bear. And he's doing 33 miles an hour. So if you can run that fast, <laughs> Thanks for coming and bearing with me. Are there any questions? And we yes, have sir. a microphone here, so raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, all the right up front. Right here. By the way, while we're waiting for the microphone, come here. This is, uh, this is Bailey, he's the brains of the outfit. He does all the bookings and accounting and everything. And then he looks like he doesn't really know anything, but he actually speaks two languages. <laughs> Sit. Sit. Can you speak? <laughs> English. Want to hear French? French, yeah. OK. Speak. <laughs> French. <laughs> English was riff, and French was riff. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Two questions. Um, first, um, during a 24-hour day, when are bears most active? Um, they can be active anytime there's food around, but they are active sort of dusk, nighttime is a lot of their, their movement. Oh, but, they can, but they can be active all, all day. Are they, in, uh, you may have heard, of course, how ticks are decimating the moose population. Right. Do ticks impact bears? Um, I don't rightly know that. I believe that the ticks that go with a moose are specific to the deer family. But the one thing that I surmise is that ticks don't affect the bear as much because of the thickness of their hair. And so by the, t it's, it's so, and you come up and see it afterwards, you can see how thick it is um, that ticks wouldn't get through to the actual skin to bite. But I don't know that for sure. That's my surmise. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Is it, is it correct that the hump on the shoulder of a grizzly bear is made of muscle? Um, it's fat and muscle, but primarily fat where they do their um, they hold their hibernation food too, so it's a fa it's a fat muscle, uh, a fat hump, but shouldered muscle too. Does that answer it? Sort of. Yes. Yes. Are bears vocal? Yes, <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, uh, some of you who might be farmers, um, a bear will sound like a lowing cow in the field and will actually call that way too. And uh, there are videos again on, uh, on the internet that if you want to, uh, they're walking through with cubs or whatever and they're constantly talking back and forth. So yes. I know camping, we heard the loud hooting and everybody said, oh, that's there. But I kind of doubted it. Uh, can a bear hoot? Yep. Yep, yep. 
And what he's doing is he's saying, hey, I've got ice cream over here. Come on over. Come for a party. Yes, sir. Interaction with dogs. My dog happens to, uh, well, she's run into a few bears and chases them. Uh, I'm wondering what the, uh, what the bear will do eventually. If they just run off or will they stop, stand, and attack? All depends on how just exactly the same thing. If they don't have an escape route, they'll attack. And if the bear tree, if the dog gets the bear cornered where they don't have a tree to climb or something, they'll turn and, at and attack it most probably. But it's it, much less so than, yeah, I mean, the probability of that is probably low. Yes? I'm, I'm glad you brought up the risk of uh, wind turbines and other similar developments to the bear. And in, in this area, there was a possible uh, big wind project. And one of the concerns was that it was in a bear habitat. I wonder if you have any information about uh, the study that is presumably happening um, in southwestern Vermont, in Searsburg. The, I do, uh, I do not. Yeah, there, yeah, there's a very large wind project that was built in what was considered a critical bear habitat. And the developer had to pay a million dollars to the state of Vermont to yes. or stop it. I've, I've heard that, but where it is and what they found, I do not have any information. Clearly, it just did not seem to be a good idea to do study or no study. Yeah, well, uh, it's not just bear, but it's deer as well. Yeah. So they have deer yards for the winter, and they don't, you know, you say, well, it's just a bunch of trees. Well, those deer have been going to that yard for years centuries, if, if not. And if you disturb that, then you've disturbed their whole habitat or a vernal pool or any of those things. And it behooves us to be a little more aware of who we live with and how we impact them. Yeah, it should be done. But I, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> There's a question back here. Yes, sorry. Um, having lived in Pennsylvania and here, um, Central Pennsylvania, and it seemed to me when we were there, the bears um, were a lot bigger. Uh, I think where we lived, there was a seven, eight hundred pound bear, black bear, and um, I regularly saw bear where we lived. I could smell them also when they were in the area. So uh, were they clean or were they not? They smelled just like a bear. It wasn't stinky. It just was bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but here, living here now, and I hear about bear and. What you said, 250 to 350 pounds, that seems like what people are saying is a really big bear. I think of a really big bear as seven or 800 pounds. Is it that they're growing bigger in central Pennsylvania? Uh, we hunt, they hunt them there as well as here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the central part of it, or whether it's crossed, or whether there's better food, or because there's more grain and wider, you know, prairie type stuff. Could very well be, but bear animal size is dependent on the food sources that they have and the season through which they can get it. So perhaps up here the season is shorter and the actual extent of corn or whatever is not as good as what you have there and would affect the size. And do they get to 700 pounds? I'm not sure. But the average black bear, 350, there are ex the outliers, they go up to five, six, 700 pounds perhaps. But they wouldn't be the normal, the norm. Can I also follow up on the uh, development question about sure. the turbines and the habitat fragmentation and all of that? So are black bears affected by uh, all the little, you know, like logging roads and um, houses, like one house every 25 acres or so, something like that, which you see um, all over the place? Or is it better to concentrate? Are they not affected by that quite as much? Or is it better to concentrate not just the large projects like wind turbines and big developments, but also spot, you know? Keep, keep, yeah. So um, that's a hard question because animals will adapt just like we adapt to things. And so if they, um, if they have a house here and a house there and so on and so forth, they'll adapt to it. It does, it does break up their territorial sort of range. Um, there's a project in um, northern Vermont called Cold Hollow to Canada. 
and which tries to buy up tracts and have an actual big, huge, unpopulated area that goes up into the arboreal forests of Canada and will allow for larger animals to track back and forth. And if, and a bear is shy. If a bear is, you know, I mean, once it gets accustomed to things, it's not shy, but it's, it's normally shy and lives hidden away. So is it affected? Probably. Will it adapt? Probably. There are bears, and you saw the picture of the bear going to the shopping mall, you know, um, that type of thing. So everything's adaptable, but it won't be the same as had we not done it. Well, we lost a bear in Chester uh, area this summer because it was too familiar with people, so it had to be destroyed. Yeah, which there's, yeah, it always happens that way. Yes? We moved uh, west for a while. Um, Hang on, I don't know if that is working. When well, we moved out west, we went to some of the national parks a number of years ago, and the bears went to the garbage dumps, and <laughs> that's where they ate. And eventually the national parks did something different with their garbage. Um, there is something going on in the state of Vermont that us with our recycling, we're supposed to recycle metal and everything, and they're going to institute something that's to recycle food scraps. I suppose it would start with the agricultural people uh, that make beer and hay or milk or whatever, but what's that going to do with the bears if we are composting? Have you seen the latest bear with the napkin around this thing? He's got the napkin. <laughs> He's waiting. <laughs> um, we have that up in our neck of the woods already. Um, and we actually have Casella. I don't know if he's down here. Casella is a waste hauler. And they have the Northwest um, district that comprises of several towns. And they actually send a truck by for the composting. And that then goes to a farm and they have a, an industrial type of composting thing with very high temperatures. It's not in a furnace or anything, but what they do with it is they create a composting system that has a much higher temperature than we do at home in our, in our personal composters. That's why they can do bones, they can do meat, they can do all of that kind of stuff. And that then, once it's composted, goes back out as a fertilizer. Um, those are probably going to be under you know, some sort of security. But if you're going to put your compost out in your backyard in your little thing, you might run into bears. But I, I think that's a small price to pay for being able to recycle and not have a landfill. Mm -hmm. Off my soft box. So. Yes? Can I, if I find a bear's conference in my yard, like in the, in the snow, yep. can I? Get a sense for how big that bear is from the size of the print? Yes. Triple E, boot size, big bear. <laughs> so this is this is a small bear. Much bigger bear. This is a little um, this tells this because it was, you know, spread out in mud and stuff. It might not be a true, true size, but you can see there is quite the difference. So yes, size will tell you. That small one, about what weight size would you put that in? Um, this is this bear, approximately. So this is probably about 180, 175. Thank you. I'm guessing. Yes. Uh, I had some horseback riding friends who like to put bells, it seems like especially in the fall, on their saddles or whatever to, I assume, not spook a bear. Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's like anything else. It's like the deer noise-making manufacturer will sell you a thing to put on your bumpers so that when you drive, they go, Uh, same thing with, you know, a bear will smell you and hear you 
before you even, yeah. and the clomping of the horse and the bridle and so. But the bell manufacturer said it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there are no bell manufacturers. <laughs> So how I get into trouble. Yes? How do you differentiate between a bear hoop and an owl hoop? And when do bears hoop? Because we always have that debate. It's an owl. No, it's a bear. It's an owl. No, it's a bear. Who, who's having that debate? You and your husband? It's a bear. He's saying it's just an owl. You're right. <laughs> Not to be facetious, that's an argument that you're going to be able to have all day long. I don't, I can't imitate properly. I mean, I can do an owl, but only one type of owl. We did a, a thing on owls here, and I, I, I played a whole, um, you know, a whole set of different sounds, and, and some of them you wouldn't even think were owls. So the best thing that I can suggest for you to do is go to the internet and pull up sounds, hooting bears, hooting owls, and play them, and you'd probably get a good idea. But don't forget, wind direction, temperature, surroundings will all affect the sound quality and the way you hear it. And so, is it the way they recorded it at the time they recorded it? It's my suggestion, enjoy the argument, enjoy the noise, be right. <laughs> Yes? Um, about warning bears and the bell, well, if you're backpacking or hiking out, like in the Tetons, for example, you wear a bell on your backpack, or you take two sticks and you clank them together as you're walking along. And since bears can smell so much better than deer, etc., is this really pointless? And if you're out there with grizzly bears, anyhow, brown bears don't care, and they'll right. go after you anyway, so it's probably pointless to you that Anyway? A foot long and a foot long with a piece of salad? <laughs> That's kidding. No, the thing is, I mean, if you want to have certain precautions, great, makes you feel better. Whether it does anything for the bear, I'm not sure. Well, but I mean, is this really going to protect you? Yeah, I know the bear bags and you hang your stuff up in the Yeah, that, that for sure. Um, but I mean, you're walking, you're walking, you're talking, unless you're by yourself but you're probably singing, whatever. You're making enough noise, and depending on where you're going, you're leaving your scent trail and everything else. Anything else that you do makes you feel good, but it doesn't necessarily do anything for the bear. The, right, right. So I, but, but don't let me stop you from putting a bell on your, you know, because, because as I said, it makes you have a sense of security, which is probably a good thing. Well, no, actually, I'd rather be able to hear what's around me. And it is when walking by oneself, when you're not talking yeah. to somebody. There. But I'd much rather be listening to the woods. Than so the bear's in there, bell. jingle bells, jingle bells. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I, I too am a proponent of being as quiet and as with the areas that you walk in because there are so many sounds and so many things that you can appreciate that anything, if you, if you, so I have a story of my brother who is not like me at all. And uh, so he, he had white knee socks, basketball, drove a Porsche, had a boom box, right? And I invited him up to my country place that had running water, no electricity, uh, gas lights. And I said, come on up and enjoy the loons and the moose and yeah. He came up, and the first thing he said to me, uh, it was a mile and a half from the main road, the first thing he said to me is, you gotta cut the grass, because the grass in the middle of the median is cutting my, the <laughs> plastic on my Porsche. And I said, I'll get right to it. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Needless to say, I never saw him again, but. Yes? Um, uh, the first pair we saw. saw. Right, up, right up to you. The first bear we saw this uh, several years ago at our house. Uh, we had a feeder on a wire, as you saw, figuring it was flying up out of the way. And a good sized bear came along, very gentlemanly. I thought it was a male. And he just you know, hung on to it and lapped the seeds out of it. 
took pictures of. But I noticed that uh, he had a, a white V on his chest. Is that fairly rare? No, I'm sorry, I, I should have mentioned that. So they have a tan muzzle and they have a white marking on the chest. So that's a black bear. Right, male or female. You're welcome. Any other questions? So usually they tell you that you have to start the presentation with a joke. So if you're not ready to go yet, I've got one short joke. A husband and wife, married for many, many years, were driving in the car. And of course, as is wont, they were arguing. And after about an hour of arguing, she finally said, <coughs> looked out the window. And he <coughs> and it drove. And then all of a sudden, they passed a meadow full of donkeys. She looks at that and says, those jackasses your relatives? <laughs> he looks at her and says, yeah, they're my in-laws. <laughs> Thank you very much.